So um, welcome everyone to our virtual uh, lecture tonight. Uh, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with me and Rachel uh, this evening. I was really blown away by how many folks are interested in RSVP'd for this talk. So I really genuinely appreciate the interest and I hope this is gonna be a meaningful uh, talk for everyone. I have about 50, 55 slides and I'm really only planning on spending maybe 30 to 40 minutes going over some basic information. But then I have uh, plenty of time after the lecture to um, stick around and answer any more specific questions, provide any references, get into more detail about any specifics that folks uh, would like to chat about. So please feel free to take notes and bring up any questions as we go. Uh, Rachel will cue me with uh, all the questions um, at the end. So my name's uh, Matthew Nurkey. I'm a physiatrist and I am one of the physicians here at Vail Summit Orthopedics and Neurosurgery. I do many things in my practice. Um, one of the uh, more major uh, pursuits and interests that I have is in regenerative medicine. And that's gonna be the major talk of topic, topic of talk uh, for tonight. I'm also gonna touch on a new innovative uh, treatment that's being expanded to multiple diagnoses for more long-term pain short of surgery. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So tonight's talk is uh, brought to us uh, with the hard work of our good folks over at our research foundation. Um, our foundation is focused on expanding orthopedic and neurosurgical care, improving outcomes through research and education. So I appreciate uh, any of the research folks that help put this together if they're on the call tonight. Uh, next, we'll talk about disclosures. So um, I'm gonna be talking about several regenerative medicine treatments, a few of which are provided by companies. Uh, one of the procedures that I'll be going on uh, over at the end of the talk um, also has some industry sponsored uh, research. I have absolutely no uh, financial incentive or any financial uh, relationship with these companies. I'm a physician at VSO and that's pretty much it. So um, to tell you a little bit more about myself, I grew up in upstate New York and then went on to complete my undergraduate uh, pre-medical training at Virginia Tech uh, down in Southwest Virginia, and then returned to upstate New York for medical school at Upstate Medical University in Syracuse. When I was a uh, second year, I came to a conference here in Keystone. And before I uh, even knew what I really wanted to get into, I had a dream of coming out here and practicing in my career. And ultimately as my, um, career path became more defined, it ultimately became a goal, and now it's you know really a realization of a long-term dream and goal to be out here. So I really appreciate everyone welcoming me uh, into the community. Uh, it's been great. I'm just in the second half of my second year, so thank you very much for having me and, and hosting me for the talk tonight. Um, after I graduated medical school, I went on to specialty training at the University of Colorado and I practiced in Denver and Boulder, uh, receiving uh, my residency training in physical medicine and rehabilitation. And at this point, I am a board certified uh, physiatrist. After residency training, um, if that wasn't enough, I went on to one additional year of subspecialty training with Dr. Boulder out in beautiful Napa, California that was focused on interventional sports, spine, and most uh, pertinent for the talk tonight, uh, regenerative medicine. And regenerative medicine is what I'm gonna spend the majority of the talk uh, on tonight. I imagine that's what folks are most interested in and have the most questions, but certainly during the Q&A session, I'm happy to discuss you know, really any topic of, of interest uh, for the folks out there tonight. In terms of uh, regenerative medicine, um, this is really, a, you know, a very deep uh, topic. It could, you know, in my case, take a full year of fellowship to uh, come to the understanding that I have at this point. Um, you know, at the very least, these topics could fill a, a weekend or week-long seminar. Um, I'm going to try to, you know, breeze through in 30 to 40 minutes, hit some of the high points, introduce some topics, um, some, com some concepts uh, when it comes to regenerative medicine, but I do realize this is not an exhaustive literature search and doesn't go into every uh, finite detail of the topic. So please feel free to ask any questions on further um, information that you may desire from the talk tonight. Uh, this kind of goes without saying, but I always like to start my talks on treatment uh, with just a slide that prompts me to talk about diagnosis. So the focus of my practice is, of course, getting folks feeling better. And the most important primary step in that process is obtaining a correct and accurate diagnosis so that treatment plans, be they conservative treatments, interventional uh, treatments, or ultimately surgical care, 
be delivered to the right target and ultimately uh, deliver the right outcomes um, to allow folks to get back to what they're doing. So um, just be mindful that if you are seeking uh, regenerative medicine treatments with you know, other clinics that they really are mindful of what they are treating and expected outcomes uh, with each specific diagnosis that we're treating. We're gonna look at a few uh, general categories of diagnosis today. And again, happy to go over more specific details if folks have further questions about their particular case. When we talk about sources of pain, particularly up here in Summit County, especially chronic pain, that's functionally limiting, inhibits our ability to hike, to ski, to kayak, um, all of those you know, fun, uh, active uh, pursuits that we all are going after up here in the mountains. They generally fall into a few major categories of diagnoses, and those are by far and away most commonly osteoarthritis, back pain related to osteoarthritis of our joints, uh, degenerative disc disease affecting our intervertebral discs, uh, primarily our cervical and lumbar, so our neck and low back. Um, as well as tendon related pain due to chronic tendinopathy. We're gonna look at each of these somewhat separately uh, when it comes to a few of the research studies out there and the underlying mechanisms of how regenerative medicine may uh, help pain related to these diagnoses. We talk about treatment of these uh, general classes of diagnosis. There's kind of a dizzying array of possibilities out there that we can pursue and, and Typically, we start with a conservative care program and progress to more interventional and ultimately surgical care as necessary to get symptoms under control. Um, treatments for joint pain related to osteoarthritis, tendon related pain and back pain may include treatments like physical therapy, bracing, medications, several types of injections, including corticosteroids, prolotherapy, uh, visco supplementation or hyaluronic acid injection, seen here is a picture of Synvisc-1, which is one of the more uh, lubricant type injections that we use for particularly osteoarthritis of the knee. We'll be revisiting um, Synvisc and its, and its uh, other uh, shared derivatives of hyaluronic acid um, as it's used for a gold standard in treatment for many uh, osteoarthritic related painful studies and it'll be compared to PRP and bone marrow aspirate concentrate stem cells in several of the studies that we look at. It typically provides a pretty consistent six month of significant pain and functional improvement in knee osteoarthritis. So it's used as um, a control in studies, a comparison group. Uh, beyond our typical injectable treatments, we have some newer options out there and those are our biologic or regenerative medicine uh, treatments. And those include PRP or platelet-rich plasma, stem cells, particularly BMAC or bone marrow aspirate concentrate, which we'll go into uh, some detail tonight. There's also uh, other longer term pain relieving procedures that involve uh, using microwave electricity um, to create lesions in our painful nerves. Um, and we'll talk about that at the end of the talk. Those are called radio frequency ablations. And finally, of course, what BSO is most well known for is our excellent surgical care. And certainly that's an option for several of the painful conditions that we're discussing tonight. So let's talk a little bit about um, PRP. So I'm just gonna go over some of the highlights of the physiology of how platelets uh, function in improving pain uh, from these various orthopedic conditions. Platelet physiology is uh, very interesting and, and complex. There are a few um, important um, kind of waypoints along the way of how a platelet functions. Essentially, I think of a platelet as a single use surgeon that's able to hone in on damaged collagen fibers, uh, activate as a result of uh, that witnessed damaged collagen fiber, stick to that fiber, grab onto its uh, other platelet friends, and ultimately degranulate and release growth factors directly on the injured tissue as seen in this schematic here. Take a look at some pictures. I think platelets are very interesting. So platelets, when they circulate around in our blood, are very boring discoid uh, appearing structures. And when they come into contact with damaged collagen fibers, such as in osteoarthritis or a torn tendon, um, they become activated platelets. And activated platelets grow these very interesting three-dimensional projections that allow the platelet to express receptors that are involved in grabbing onto these damaged collagen fibers and ultimately delivering growth factors direct, directly onto the site of injury. Once platelets are activated, they go through this process of adhesion, adhesion and aggregation. These are both uh, scanning electron micrograph pictures of platelets, so true photographs of 
uh, platelets through a very high power microscope. The colors are added. Um, we can see here a platelet a clump uh, over top of a uh, degenerated collagen fiber. And the platelet down here on the bottom right is undergoing this process of degranulation. So what does degranulation mean? This is really the most uh, important step in the function of a platelet to uh, perform wound healing functions. Platelets are full of over 1200 uh, growth factors and other peptides. You know, to be honest, there's like a dozen that are very, very well understood in terms of their role in uh, improving pain with uh, regard to osteoarthritis and tendon uh, and disc related pain. These are some of the more important ones uh, listed here. They include growth factors uh, such as platelet derived growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factor, fibroblast growth factor, transforming growth factor beta, et cetera. If you read through the uh, summary of uh, the mechanism of action of these growth factors, we can see some commonalities among them. Um, these growth factors are intimately involved in wound healing through their ability to um, promote collagen synthesis, reorganize collagen, promote angiogenesis or new blood vessel formation to support this new tissue, and you know, in summary, essentially promote wound healing in our arthritic joints, our painful tendons, and our degenerated discs in our spine. Stem cells are another uh, piece of the puzzle when it comes to biologic treatment. I generally put quotes around stem cells uh, when I talk to patients about this stuff because there are some caveats uh, when we use uh, stem cells for clinical care and some important clarifications that I think should be made when we um, are counseling patients about uh, the use of stem cells for management of their pain. First, there are uh, several FDA uh, guidelines that require compliance within the United States. The central edict of the FDA when it comes to stem cells, as well as PRP, is this thought of minimal manipulation. So here in the continental United States, we're able to process uh, stem cells and platelets by simple means, such as centrifugation, where the sample is spun at a high uh, rate of speed, which allows us to separate the different cell types by density and concentrate them in that way. We are not allowed uh, by the FDA to take your stem cells out of your body grow them in a cell culture, and then inject them back into your body on a different day. There are certainly clinics, some of which are very legitimate, some of which are not um, abroad. Uh, they exist in the Cayman Islands and Panama and Europe. If folks are interested in that, certainly you can get into more detail on those type of treatments. When it comes to stem cells, really the level of evidence when it comes to the scientific literature is actually quite low, although across uh, essentially the majority of studies, if not all, they have shown fairly significant benefit, particularly with regard to osteoarthritis. Although there are no um, true randomized control trials that are of a high level to really prove the effectiveness, although there's you know, several case series, anecdotal evidence, and we'll go over uh, some of that today. Uh, the level of evidence for PRP, particularly when it comes to tendon related disorders, is far greater than that of stem cells, although there may be some additional benefit uh, with stem cell injections that we'll go over here shortly. Uh, stem cells come from several sources. Uh, the exclusive source of stem cells that I use are bone marrow derived stem cells, and we'll talk about how I achieve uh, processing of those cells later in the talk. You can also obtain stem cells from adipose or, or fat tissue through liposuction as well as stem cells from others' uh, bodies, and those include placental tissue, umbilical cord, um, as well as cord blood, among some other uh, treatments that are out there. I don't use any of those uh, products from others' bodies, including this placental, umbilical cord, cord blood type tissue, and I'll talk about why briefly uh, in a bit. So exclusively bone marrow derived stem cells. We talk about stem cells, there are several types of stem cells uh, that exist in our body. The most important of which uh, for the topic tonight are a type of stem cell called mesenchymal stem cells, or MSCs, moving forward. MSCs are very interesting cells in that they have the ability to not only self-renew, but also uh, terminally differentiate into several important cell types involved in repairing tissue um, that underlies joint, tendon, and back pain. Specifically, they can differentiate, differentiate excuse me, into chondrocytes, which have the ability to produce cartilage. They can uh, differentiate into fibroblasts and ultimately tenocytes, which are responsible for secreting the extracellular matrix of our tendons. 
as well as osteoblasts, which are involved in bone formation, myoblasts, which are involved in muscle formation, and a few other cell types that are not as directly relevant uh, to orthopedic-related uh, pain. Again, just like uh, platelets, MSC uh, physiology is very interesting and very intricate. Um, it goes a little bit beyond the purview of the talk tonight to get into each of these signaling pathways, but there are some general uh, themes here that are important in terms of the function of MSCs. They have both anti and pro-inflammatory effects on the local tissue, both of which are important for wound healing. They promote angiogenesis, similar to platelets, which allows for new blood vessel formation to support wound healing and new tissue. They also promote migration of local stem cells, uh, which are already present in each of our joints, our intervertebral discs, and at the junction of our tendons and bones. And finally, they're able to directly differentiate into different cell types that we just discussed, um, including cartilage, uh, tendon, and muscle producing cells, among others. When we talk about stem cells, this is a conversation, if any, if any uh, of the participants out there have had a conversation with me about this, I try to be very candid about what's out there in terms of the research, potential risks, realistic outcomes. I think it's really important to have a frank discussion about your um, individual diagnosis, your individual treatment plan, and expected um, post-procedural course in the context of those considerations. There's a lot of folks um, that are in the business of stem selling stem cells, and um, it's something that you have to be very careful about out there. Um, you want to make sure that we have realistic expectations and a true diagnosis before we uh, proceed with a treatment like this. Case in point is, uh, was really well documented uh, by a podcast uh, called Bad Batch that some of you may have listened to. It was produced by a podcast company called Wondery. And it really followed this company, Levion, which was involved in uh, producing stem cell products from um, umbilical cord blood of very low quality with very little quality control. And unfortunately, at least a dozen patients suffered very significant infections from these preparations, um, many of which were hospitalized, often for a month or longer. So these are very serious, bad outcomes. This is a uh, case in point to the reason why I do not use any of these products. We cannot ensure they're sterile um, and we cannot ensure that uh, quality control is going on with a third party. So my approach is to use your body's own stem cells that are live, processed under sterile conditions and injected directly uh, back into your body at the site of pathology. I think that is the safest, most well studied and uh, frankly, most effective modality to pursue when it comes to stem cells. So with that counterpoint in place, let's get into a little bit more detail about legitimate stem cell and PRP use in orthopedic care. Uh, procedures with PRP and uh, bone marrow derived stem cells are performed uh, essentially exclusively as an outpatient. Uh, they can be done both in the clinic setting or in the uh, surgical center setting, although all patients are discharged to home the same day. Uh, the decision point between doing a procedure in the clinic uh, versus the surgery center comes down to the diagnosis being treated, the degree of imaging guidance that's necessary, uh, what equipment we need to perform uh, the procedure, and also the level of sedation that's required for the patient. Um, there are also some cost considerations related to clinic-based versus surgery center-based uh, interventions. I'm happy to go over those if uh, folks have some questions uh, regarding the cost of these procedures. Um, move on from there. Uh, when it comes to the procedure of um, performing either PRP or bone marrow derived stem cells, there are some considerations both pre and post uh, procedurally. Most importantly, if you uh, come and see me and would like to do a PRP or a stem cell injection, I do ask that we hold all anti-inflammatory medications uh, for at least two weeks uh, prior and at least two weeks post procedurally. The bio, uh, I'm sorry, the bio, um, chemical uh, underpinning of this decision has to do with a molecule called thromboxane. Thromboxane is a molecule that's inhibited by the use of anti-inflammatories and is very important in the process of platelet aggregation. So we want our platelets to be very sticky and functional so that they can hone in, stick to our damaged collagen fibers and ultimately release their growth factors directly on these fibers. So that is the purpose of coming off those medications for a couple of weeks. Uh, the process of making uh, PRP is uh, fairly straightforward. 
It involves a peripheral blood draw, typically from the elbow. We then spin the whole blood in a centrifuge using our uh, spin techniques. We use a double spin uh, protocol, which allows us to control our quality a little, little bit better than some of the older techniques. Um, cell types are differentiated and separated by density. Uh, ultimately, we concentrate the plasma and platelet portion and remove the uh, red blood cells uh, from the sample and then finally inject uh, these cells directly into the site of tissue damage. Uh, bone marrow is achieved um, in a similar way. Instead of uh, performing a peripheral uh, blood draw, we do a bone marrow harvest. I almost exclusively obtain bone marrow from the iliac crest, so from the top of the buttock in our large uh, pelvic bone. I use ultrasound guidance, such as the picture on the top left, so that we can have real-time imaging of the needle entering the marrow cavity for safety. Uh, once the bone marrow is withdrawn from the marrow cavity, typically we take 60 to 120 cc's of raw bone marrow, and the same for PRP. It is processed in a very similar way to concentrate the stem cells and platelets and remove the red cells, which are very inflammatory. Once our sample is prepared with our concentrated cellular solution, I uh, almost exclusively use imaging guidance to perform these injections and in clinic-based interventions. I typically use ultrasound guidance and this allows me to uh, obtain real-time images of our uh, injection and ensure quality control for proper placement within the joint tendon, ligament, or what have you that we'd be treating. Uh, when we talk about intraspinal procedures, be it an intradiscal, so into our intervertebral discs of our spine or into our facet joints, I do typically go to the surgery center and use fluoroscopic guidance as this allows a higher level of quality control again. Uh, Post-procedurally, there's a pretty typical course uh, for all patients that receive a PRP and stem cell injection. Uh, the way I typically describe this is you can expect your old unhealed injury to turn into a new injury with the cellular machinery necessary for it to heal. What that typically means is it feels like a new injury, so it causes a flare-up of pain for one to two weeks. Uh, sometimes it's shorter, typically it tapers off by the two-week mark. And then the process of um, recovery and rehabilitation happens over the next two to three months. It's not uncommon for the positive benefit from a PRP or stem cell injection to take six to eight weeks to start to manifest. And symptom improvement can continue for up to six to 12 months post-procedurally. So it's truly a long-term treatment. Um, the um, duration of effect in terms of how long these type of injections help for is variable depending on the disease severity. So uh, these treatments are much more effective for mild to moderate arth arthritis uh, than they are for more severe arthritis, um, things along those lines. That's where a consultation with your physician um, to really talk about individual treatment plan and expectations is important uh, before proceeding with an intervention such as this. So now that we have a little background on what PRP is, some thoughts on stem cells and what the procedure looks like. I'd like to start looking at a little bit of data on some of the individual diagnoses that we use uh, these treatments for. So we'll start with tendinopathy. Uh, this was uh, previously commonly called tendinitis that uh, nomenclature has largely fallen out of favor as uh, there has been several studies done where biopsies of painful tendons have been taken and there, there actually is very little inflammation in these tendons. But what we do typically see is a breakdown of the collagen superstructure of the, uh, of the tendon. Uh, associated with that is relatively poor and unorganized blood supply and ultimately poor healing in this tendon. This breakdown of the collagen architecture you'll see is a common theme among the diagnoses that we use regenerative medicine treatments for, as this is a direct target of treatment for both PRP and stem cells, as we previously saw. Uh, we're going to look at a few studies. So this is a uh, systematic review and meta-analysis of all of the randomized control trials that were out in 2016 when this systematic review was published. There are um, several more at this point. This study um, encompassed 16 randomized control trials that compared platelet-rich plasma versus steroid injections, as well as control injections with uh, anesthetic only, so lidocaine or saline as a negative control. 
Um, at this point, there's at least 30 randomized control trials. Uh, randomized control trials are really the highest level of evidence that we have when it comes to medical research. So very well studied treatment modality for the treatment of painful tendons. This is a very busy summary side, you'll, slide. You'll see these uh, meta-analyses really like to pack a lot of data in very small areas. But I just wanted to cover some high points here. We can see the uh, sample size within these studies range from fairly small samples that um, had 20 to 30 patients up to studies that uh, contained over 200 patients. Uh, the average age of the study participants was actually relatively young for these uh, type of studies, excuse me, and it was in the 30s and 40s, um, primarily with some studies um, studying patients in their uh, early 50s studied several painful tendons, including the Achilles tendon, patellar tendon of the knee, uh, the rotator cuff, as well as our lateral epicondylar tendons that are responsible for uh, tennis elbow. Essentially, all of these studies required patients to have symptoms of some chronicity, typically at least three months, which is my general preference. Some of these painful tendons certainly heal on their own, which is why I don't like to overtreat folks with these type of treatments. So typically three months of persistent symptoms um, is enough to warrant a treatment such as this. And these studies um, looked at several outcome measures, including BAS, which is a pain scale, as well as several uh, functional scales pertinent to the particular tendon being studied. And they followed patients out to six to 12 to 24 months, so really long-term follow-up in some of these studies. Uh, this is their summary slide. These meta-analyses, again, have somewhat busy uh, information in them, so I apologize about this if you're not familiar with this type of graph. <clears throat> Excuse me, so this is called the forest plot. Excuse me. Forest plots uh, aim to standardize outcome measures across studies and look across studies at overall effect size of treatments. And we can see um, in summary across all of these 16 randomized uh, control trials on the bottom that there is a uh, statistically significant positive benefit that favors PRP over uh, steroid and other control interventions. And that uh, duration of effect persisted out to and sometimes past two years of treatment. So truly demonstrating the long-term nature of uh, improvement with interventions such as PRP for painful tendons. This is a couple ultrasound pictures that are uh, anonymized from a patient that I treated with tennis elbow or common extensor tendinopathy. Um, if you're familiar with ultrasound on the top picture, uh, you can see a fairly degenerated tendon. There are several intricate deposits. The overall structure of the tendon has lost its um, fibrillar architecture with regard to the collagen fibers. And you can see the needle uh, coming in right to left here. And then the picture on the bottom, this injection picture um, showing successful spread of the PRP throughout essentially the entirety of the tendon. Um, this is another patient that was treated um, at my fellowship with Dr. Boder. Uh, this is an Achilles tendon. You can see quite clearly um, an intratendinous defect within the Achilles tendon. So this is a partial thickness intrasubstance Achilles tear, uh, which is a great um, diagnosis to treat with uh, PRP. For this patient, we performed an ultrasound guided uh, PRP injection directly into that lesion. You can see the platelets uh, filling that previous defect. In this particular case, we use activated, which is um, a specific type of PRP that acts a little bit more like glue for these type of tendon tears. Um, and then ultimately we followed up with this patient approximately 12 months uh, down the line, performed a diagnostic ultrasound. You can see at this point, collagen fiber is now uh, bridging the gap of that intratendinous defect and correlated with this was significant improvement in the patient's pain and, and function as a corollary. So another success story there. So now we'll switch uh, gears and talk about osteoarthritis. This is an exceptionally common uh, pain generator, especially in our patients of uh, Medicare years that are still out there, you know, mountain biking, skiing, um, doing um, very active activities up here in the mountains. Um, osteoarthritis is essentially progressive degradation of our articular cartilage. You can see you can uh, define this based on grade of severity from doubtful to mild to moderate to severe, ranging from one to four in grades. On a microstructural level, you know, what's happening here in arthritis? Uh, we can see here uh, collagen fibers are the black lines and chondrocytes are the circles with the nucleus. Uh, we can see as osteoarthritis progresses, there is progressive loss of our collagen fibers and our chondrocytes, which are responsible for producing um, that cartilage matrix. 
And if you remember back to our, tar our previous uh, topic on the physiology of both platelets and uh, mesenchymal stem cells, we know that platelets are intimately involved in collagen synthesis and mesenchymal stem cells have the ability to support um, cartilage production through differentiation to chondrocytes and migration of local stem cells um, that are already native uh, in the joint. So the typical way that I treat osteoarthritis with biologics is if it's more early osteoarthritis, that's more of a collagen defect, I typically treat it with PRP, which is less invasive, less expensive. Whereas if we have more advanced than the moderate to severe category of osteoarthritis, I typically uh, will recommend a stem cell or bone marrow aspirate concentrate injection to introduce those chondrocytes um, to the local environment and allow for additional repair over and above what PRP is able to provide. Uh, so let's look at a couple studies. This is again, another meta-analysis of uh, randomized control trials that looked at the use of PRP versus an active treatment in hyaluronic acid that we briefly touched on earlier. Hyaluronic acid, just to recall, is uh, another word for that is visco supplementation or lubricant shot or rooster cone uh, shots. And so these are lubricant shots that are well proven to provide approximately six months of significant symptom improvement in patients diagnosed with symptomatic knee osteoarthritis and is used as a gold standard for uh, comparison in a lot of these biologic studies. Again, another busy summary slide, but just to reiterate a couple of key points. These uh, studies were completed really all across the world, uh, some of which were in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere. Uh, a little bit higher patient population in these uh, studies, uh, typically on the order of uh, approximately 100 patients or so per study group. Uh, average age of the patients in this osteoarthritic um, Samples uh, study uh, or studies in the sample, ex uh, excuse me, uh, were a little bit older than our tendon related um, studies and more in the 50 to 60 year old range, which is pretty typical for symptomatic osteoarthritis. Uh, we can see that um, in general, more early stages of osteoarthritis were treated uh, in these studies, more in the mild to moderate range, although some patients with more moderate to severe osteoarthritis were included um, as well. You can see here another forest plot comparing uh, pooled outcomes across these studies. I'll just kind of walk you through the high points because these are uh, somewhat confusing to look at. Uh, on the left side are different outcome measures at different times across the studies. So we can see outcomes were measured at one, two, three, six, and 12 months post-procedurally. And essentially across every time point, there was statistically significant improvement, particularly in pain and functional scales. Uh, with PRP providing significantly greater benefit than our gold standard known effective treatment of hyaluronic acid injections. Um, the one uh, subset of data that was not clinically significant in terms of its uh, outcome measure was the um, EQVAS, which is really a measure of general health and not necessarily joint pain or function. So again, just be realistic with our expectations. A, a PRP injection into our knee isn't going to improve our general uh, health, but certainly has the opportunity to prove, improve our knee pain and knee function out to and certainly past at least a year. And that's pretty well documented across um, over 20 randomized control trials. All right, well, that study looked at more mild to moderate osteoarthritis, how about more moderate to severe osteoarthritis, perhaps, perhaps folks that are interested in potentially pursuing a joint replacement but aren't ready to commit uh, to an invasive surgical procedure um, just yet. Um, this is another study, it's a study looking at stem cells or bone marrow aspirate concentrate. Um, this is not a systematic review, it's not a meta-analysis, it's not a randomized control trial. Like I said previously, the level of evidence out there for stem cell studies is, is fairly low. Um, this is a case series that followed uh, 121 patients. Uh, the mean age of the patients was 70. Every patient had grade three to four, so moderate to severe osteoarthritis that was symptomatic in one or both of their knees. Each patient underwent a bone marrow aspiration concentration and ultimately a bone marrow aspirate concentrate stem cell inject injection into their affected knee in a very similar protocol to what I use in my clinic. These patients were followed out to approximately a year post-procedurally. We can see across the entire study group, there was approximately a 50% improvement in pain severity. NPS is a measure of pain, zero to 10 uh, pain scale, and approximately 50% improvement in a knee functional score, uh, which is widely used, the Oxford knee school, uh, score. Both of these are very highly statistically significant. This is actually not my favorite way to present data in these studies, because typically what occurs is 
70 or so percent of patients experience very significant benefit, you know, 75% or more improvement in their pain, whereas 25, 30% of patients do not have uh, as profound uh, of an outcome. And this is further um, documented by uh, kind of a, a, an ancillary uh, outcome that they looked at uh, in stating that 73% of patients reported they would repeat the procedure and 86% would recommend to a friend wonder about that discrepancy of 13%. Hopefully they're all uh, just feeling better and, and wouldn't need a repeated procedure. Uh, finally, the last topic in terms of pain generators that we see commonly in our clinic is low back pain. Uh, axial low back pain affecting only the back and buttock uh, tends to be the result of osteoarthritis of the facet joints, uh, which you can see here. Uh, the same concepts that apply to knee osteoarthritis with regard to PRP for early diagnoses and bone marrow aspirate concentrate stem cells for more advanced osteoarthritis apply in this regard. So I won't uh, go over that again, but did want to look at the intervertebral disc as a source of pain. The intervertebral disc is our shock absorber in our spine. There's one at every level in between each vertebral body. Um, the picture on the left demonstrates a um, schematic of a torn disc, which is a very common source of discogenic pain. We can see from our structural uh, representation on the right that the disc is made uh, almost entirely of collagen, type 1 and type 2, as well as proteoglycans, which provide the shock absorbing uh, property of the disc. Uh, again, another great target for biologic treatment, be it uh, PRP or bone marrow aspirate concentrate stem cells. Um, how do we know if we have discogenic pain? On MRI is helpful to understand your anatomy, but in terms of symptoms, uh, discogenic pain is often what people describe as quote unquote, throwing their back out. It often hurts intermittently for a few days to several weeks, often associated with a significant amount of muscle spasms in the low back and tends to have an undulating course up and down over time with more frequent and severe exacerbations over time. Uh, this is an MRI slide of what a degenerated intervertebral disc uh, looks like. We can see here at L5-S1, our lowest uh, segment, where we have a very dark disc with a posterior annular tear uh, that's full of fluid. Uh, this is a process known as internal disc disruption or derangement. Um, intradiscal therapies with PRP and stem cells are not uh, well applied when folks have disc herniations or severe central stenosis or nerve root impingement as a result of their uh, disc degeneration. This is really for disc degeneration that stays within the borders of the original disc contour uh, primarily. Uh, the intervertebral disc can be fairly easily accessed uh, through an injection. Uh, I use the same technique outlined uh, here in this schematic. I use a two needle system to enter the disc to minimize the risk of infection uh, with disc injections. Uh, the outer cannula is advanced down to just superficial to the disc with an inner cannula that does not touch the skin advanced uh, within the geometric center and within the defect of the disc. And then you're able to deliver PRP or stem cells directly uh, within the affected uh, painful disc. Uh, this is, again, I apologize, another busy uh, summary slide looking at a systematic review for what's out there in terms of intradiscal PRP injections, particularly. Um, the last I looked, there's no high level of evidence for intradiscal bone marrow aspirate concentrate injections, although anecdotally it works actually quite well and very similarly, if not somewhat more effectively than PRP. We can see the first uh, true case series uh, that uh, enrolled 35 patients was uh, published by my fellowship director, Dr. Boder in Napa. Um, at this point, the case series uh, through his practice, which I was able to add to during my fellowship, includes over 600 discs, so quite a large case series. Uh, generally, the response rate with intradiscal PRP is on the order of 65 to 70% of patients have significant long-term improvement uh, that persists beyond one to two years. Um, although intradiscal treatments with biologics tend to be one of the slower responding uh, diagnoses to treat with biologics, often can take several months before significant improvement is noticed and truly can take up to six months to notice the full benefit, if not slightly longer. There is one randomized control trial that's been published on intradiscal PRP. It was published in uh, my uh, specialties major journal in 2016. It was published by Tauk Lee Wasorno, and it followed patients um, 
who were treated with PRP versus a control injection out to at least two months and several patients were followed up to a year and noted significant improvement out to and past the year mark in that study, which is pretty typical with intradiscal biologics. This is just the, their conclusions. I'll just read from the fourth line verbatim. Um, it's, evidence from, uh, it's evident from our review that PRP is a safe, effective, and feasible treatment modality and is evolving as a very powerful tool for the treatment of discogenic back pain. So a new treatment modality that was not around 10 years ago that truly does show long-term benefit for discogenic pain, which is exciting as it's been uh, historically hard to treat. Okay, so let's just switch gears for one final part of the talk. So I finished the portion on biologics and regenerative medicine. Happy to go into more detail uh, if anyone has questions, and I suspect there will be several on uh, different topics we brought up. Uh, so I wanted to talk about one final procedure that uh, many folks are familiar with. It's called a radiofrequency ablation. Uh, historically, this has been applied to spinal pain uh, from arthritis in our facet joints and our cervical and lumbar spine primarily. But new uh, protocols have recently been published and I've integrated them into my practice for the management of refractory knee and shoulder pain. There's also a protocol for hips that I don't feel uh, is quite uh, up to par with the shoulder and knee protocol, so I haven't integrated that yet. Um, you can see from this uh, slightly modified graph from um, Cool Leaf from Avanos, who makes the Cool Leaf radio frequency generator that uh, radio frequency ablations for low back, knee, and shoulder pain can provide up to and sometimes beyond 12 months of significant symptom improvement, which is far greater than that seen with using anti-inflammatory medications, receiving steroid injections, or um, lubricant hyaluronic acid injections. Not quite as uh, prolonged a response as you typically see with a successful PRP or stem cell injection, and certainly a painful joint that is replaced uh, well by someone like Dr. Kafferke in our practice certainly can provide long-term uh, lifelong improvement in uh, symptoms if uh, the patient does pursue that type of treatment. So what is a radiofrequency ablation? A radiofrequency ablation is essentially an injectional type treatment where we use a special type of needle that has a tip that allows us to pass a microwave um, spectrum of um, uh, waves through the uh, generator. This allows us to uh, heat up the tissue to 80 degrees Celsius. There's a few different models out there. Uh, the uh, radio frequency generator produced by Avanos is nice because it creates a somewhat larger uh, lesion size that's spherical in nature, which allows you to really cover the affected nerves. What this procedure aims to do is essentially disconnect the pain signal from our joint to our brain. In the knee, there are that are typically treated. There is an optional fourth nerve. These are the supralateral, supramedial, and inframedial genicular nerves. In order to qualify for a radiofrequency ablation procedure, first we do a set of diagnostic blocks where we go to the surgery center and inject at the same targets that we would perform the radiofrequency ablation. Uh, we inject a long-acting anesthetic or numbing medicine. And then we go home and fill out a pain diary and track our response to this treatment. If we have significant improvement during the four hours post-procedurally, we are ultimately a candidate for the ablation, which tends to provide approximately 12 months of significant symptom uh, improvement. It can be repeated yearly quite safely. Uh, the reason why pain returns after approximately a year is that our peripheral nervous system, for better or worse, is able to regenerate and regrow. And so these pain nerves do uh, regenerate and re innervate the joint ultimately, although it can be uh, quite safely and successfully uh, ablated over several time points over time. You can see, interestingly, the blocks that I performed here were for a patient that, that had a previous uh, joint replacement by another clinic. Um, it's uh, thankfully not very common to have persistent pain after a joint replacement, but for those folks who do, uh, radiofrequency ablations are an option to manage that pain year to year. Uh, which is an exciting treatment modality for several of those patients who have been able to get back to doing the activities that they were hoping to do from the joint replacement in the first place. Um, this is just one summary slide of a study. I finally reported data in the way that I like to see it. Um, so this is a multi-center randomized control trial that compared uh, the use of cooled radio frequency ablation versus hyaluronic acid, that same treatment we've been comparing all through the talk. And we can see significant improvement. The dark line is the radio frequency abl ablation group. We can see immediate and prolonged improvement uh, that's over and above that uh, attained with an intraarticular lubricant shot. 
And most importantly, you can see that 71% of patients who received a radiofrequency ablation versus 38% who received a hyaluronic acid injection had greater than 50% reduction in their pain score at six months. And this was very highly st uh, statistically significant. And this is a pretty common um, um, outcome with radiofrequency ablation where approximately three quarters of patients see significant long-term improvement up to approximately one year. Uh, just to remind folks, this is a very common procedure that's historically been done for joint pain in the spine, in our cervical and lumbar spine primarily, but new protocols are now out and I've integrated them successfully in my practice uh, for chronic knee pain, as well as chronic shoulder pain related to osteoarthritis and rotator cuff tendinopathy that may not be uh, ideal surgical candidates to take care of it more long term. So this brings me to the end of the information portion of my talk. This is kind of my summary collage. Um, just want to remind everyone that platelet and uh, stem cell physiology is very um, interesting and directly applicable to the management of pain related to osteoarthritis, tendon related pain, and low back pain related to arthritis and disc degeneration. It's important to have the proper diagnosis before we pursue a treatment like this have realistic treatment outcomes, uh, expectations for outcomes, I should say, uh, use imaging guidance to perform these injections so that the cellular concentrate is delivered directly to the site of injury to maximize our potential improvement. And finally, for folks that may not um, be a candidate for biologics or just simply not interested, um, there are other new procedures such as Cooley for radiofrequency ablation for low back, shoulder, and knee pain. So that brings me to the end. I'm happy to uh, entertain any questions, comments, uh, provide any references that uh, folks may be interested in. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Rachel to help moderate that part of the session. All right, thanks Dr. Nerke. So we're gonna start getting into questions. Um, please feel free to submit your questions uh, via the chat box or the Q&A button. Um, so getting right into it, Thomas asks, what procedures do you recommend to cure painful SI joints? Yeah, so SI joints absolutely are a big source of pain, especially up here in the mountains. Um, there are really two sources of pain when it comes to SI joint re related pain. So it can be uh, degenerative osteoarthritis affecting the joint, but then also there are very strong capsular ligaments that hold the joint together. Uh, both can be independent sources of pain. Uh, again, the treatment options for a, a symptomatic SI joint pain range the, the full gamut from conservative care with physical therapy to bracing with an SI joint belt. In terms of interventions, uh, corticosteroid injections uh, can be helpful for several months. There's also a radiofrequency ablation I did not mention um, that can be performed for the SI joint to provide approximately a year of significant pain relief. There is evidence particularly for the use of PRP, both within the joint and the capsular ligaments that both strengthen the ligaments and treat the uh, cartilage defects within the joint. And then finally, on the surgical side of things, there is a minimally invasive SI joint fusion that Dr. Braxton with our practice is considering bringing into his um, treatment uh, protocols um, that allows for a very uh, easily performed, uh, very successful uh, SI joint fusion that can help uh, more long-term as well. So several treatment options depends on kind of, you know, what our uh, desires are with treatment, but um, several options that we provide at BSO. Um, is there any scientific evidence that after a certain age, PRP or stem cells don't work nearly as well? There is, there definitely is. And um, the question is, but with a qualification. So age is, is a difficult, um, you know, final number to put on someone and say it will not work or it will work. Typically, the older we get into our 80s and 90s, our stem cells become more senescent, our platelets are less functional, which is why we bruise easier. Um, you know, our collagen is breaking down. So typically in our 80s and 90s, it's not as effective. But what's more important than chronological age is our biological age. So someone in their 70s or early 80s that's quite healthy, fit, active, uh, is going to have much healthier platelets and stem cells uh, than a medically unwell patient of the same uh, population. So it is somewhat uh, individualized, but I'd say in general in our 80s and 90s, these tend to be um, less effective overall. All right. Can, regener can regenerative procedures be applied to regrowing cartilage and shoulder joints? They can. So uh, regenerative procedures absolutely can help shoulder-related pain due to osteoarthritis and also rotator cuff tears is the other common uh, uh, diagnosis that's treated with biologics. Uh, rotator cuff tears should be very partial thickness or related more to tendinopathy. 
high grade tears uh, do uh, best with surgery, especially if they're traumatic in nature. Uh, but in terms of osteoarthritis, absolutely can improve symptoms, similar uh, type data to what you see in uh, the knee. I would say overall, the response rate is somewhat lower in the shoulder. And the way I think about it is the, you know, the gift and the curse of the shoulder is all this range of motion that we have. The fun human activities that we like to do. And with that range of motion comes some degree of instability in the joint. Um, so that uh, tends to uh, decrease our response rate by approximately 10% or so from what we see in the knee generally. Do PRP and or stem cells usually work after multiple steroid and or synvisc injections? Yeah, good question. So that's a very good question. So um, there, as far as I know, there's no real published data on this, but we did a, a, a review of our patients in fellowship and did find that several steroid injections, particularly with greater trochanteric bursitis or tendinopathy of our gluteus medius tendon, so lateral hip pain, worse when we sleep at night, uh, does inhibit the positive benefit of PRP injections. Typically, you're looking at five or more corticosteroid injections. What I counsel patients is uh, where I see a, a detriment to the effectiveness. Uh, Synvisc, though, is a different story. Synvisc uh, does not have a deleterious effect on uh, biologics. In fact, at times I inject PRP along with Synvisc or more commonly Uflexa, which is uh, slightly more cost effective. Um, the hyaluronic acid, acid has actually been shown to have synergistic effects when injected at the same time. And the uh, rationale behind that is the hyaluronic acid actually pro provides somewhat of a scaffolding to the platelets and stem cells. It allows them to stick a little bit better to our articular cartilage. So yes, in no. Somebody, so Mark asks, you take the blood platelets from your elbow to put them into your knee. Why doesn't your body do that on its own? Oh, that's a great question. So it tries. And so when we have injuries, you know, with the type of tissues that heal the best are muscles and skin and bone. Those tissues are full of blood vessels, have very rich blood supply. But when we look at degenerated cartilage, not only is the collagen uh, degraded, but so is the blood supply. Same with degenerated tendons and degenerated discs. Um, but absolutely, that's uh, the, the way I phrase it is, you know, we're restarting this healing process due to a poor blood supply that hasn't been able to uh, be completed by your body's own cells. And we're taking cells from, you know, where they are now and putting them to where they need to be to deliver these growth factors. So no, it's a good, absolutely good question. Can any of your treatments treat osteoporosis of the hip joint? Um, not necessarily osteoporosis or other uh, medical treatments for osteoporosis. Certainly osteoarthritis of the hip joint uh, uh, is uh, treated with uh, particularly bone marrow aspirate concentrate. Labral tears can be treated more successfully with PRP or activated PRP. Uh, but osteoporosis, typically we want to do weight-bearing exercises, resistance exercises. We may try medications like bisphosphonates, calcium, vitamin D supplementation. Uh, osteoporosis is more of a bone mineral density deficit. And so that has other directed treatments um, that can certainly help with that as well. Um, I'm getting a ton of questions from people, and I don't know if you have the full answer to this, and I'm sure it's kind of a multifaceted answer, but I'm getting a lot of questions about um, PRP and stem cell therapy being covered by insurance. Oh, sure, sure. So, yeah, let me talk about it. So um, it's starting. So um, work comp insurance, uh, if you're injured on the job, is, is actually a very evidence-based uh, insurance carrier. Uh, unfortunately, private insurances and public insurances are not as evidence-based, interestingly, as work comp insurance. So work comp has uh, seen uh, the significant positive benefit, the dozens of randomized control trials, and often cover this, uh, particularly for tendon and joint-related pain. Um, some private insurances, particularly kind of the Cadillac plans, are starting to cover this because they see actual cost benefit where patients are able to avoid surgical procedures by seeing improvement through these interventions. But unfortunately, it's not covered by the vast majority of more typical insurances, Medicare and Medicaid yet. I think with the overwhelming level of evidence, this is going to change at some point and the work comp insurance uh, is, is uh, kind of the first domino to fall. Kaiser, which is a closed health system, uh, very focused on the cost of care also, uh, is opening up PRP clinics particularly um, to help their patients avoid surgery and also ultimately cut costs to, um, to their plans. So it's starting, it's just not widely um, out there yet. It is uh, still considered investigational. What we can see from the studies I presented today, really the investigations um, are quite positive. So I think that will change over the next several years. All right. Sorry. 
All right. And the last procedure where you basically pull the nerve so that you don't feel the pain. I think you called it radioactive. Is that a good thing? I feel that pain tells you something is wrong and I feel you could injure yourself or worse. Or is that where the diagnosis comes in? Yeah, so it's called uh, radio frequency ablation, just to clarify. And you're absolutely right. So you want to avoid destructive procedures if you can. The main um, purpose of these nerves is to send pain. They don't control uh, really in a, in a large way any motor uh, control of your uh, strength or your core. Um, they do control some very, very small muscles that have been shown not to be functionally significant. And you're right, you, you are trying to numb these joints uh, and there are trade-offs when we do radio frequency ablations. Typically the signal that your joints are telling you is pain all the time due to osteoarthritis and there truly is nothing dangerous occurring there. Uh, very rarely do you see complications as a result of a radio frequency ablation due to that thought of numbing up the nerves. Uh, over the long term, there is one patient that I had that did suffer a spinal fracture. Um, he had multiple previous spinal surgeries that were minimally invasive that removed bone and removed bone and removed bone. Um, when we did the radio frequency ablation, uh, he felt great, started playing golf quite a bit and unfortunately suffered a spinal fracture. That's one patient in probably a thousand that I've treated with radio frequency ablation, so pretty low risk, but something that I do talk to all my patients about, particularly if they've had previous minimally invasive spinal procedures without a fusion as that's where the risk really increases. Um, but there are other nerves that innervate other structures in our spine and joints. So our discs still can cause pain, our nerve roots can still cause pain. So there are some redundancies um, to, to, that, uh, to the pain pathway, but it's a, absolutely an important consideration, something that I talk to about the trade, talk to patients about the trade-offs of these type of procedures. What do you suggest for a 61 year old woman with childhood non-treated scoliosis? And then she added, it is becoming progressive as I get older. Yeah. Important thing for um, it, uh, really adolescent scoliosis that has a degenerative component likely at this point is to maintain a good, strong, healthy core, flexible pelvis so that we can support that curve and send motion through our hips and knees that we would otherwise through our back. Um, often radio frequency ablations actually are used for the joint related pain associated with scoliosis. Typically, you know, regenerative medicine is not used as commonly in that type of diagnosis because there's several levels involved. So it's quite an extensive procedure if you were to pursue something like that. But really, I think the best treatment is, is really focusing on physical therapy, uh, home-based exercise program like Pilates and yoga to really keep our, our core strong and our pelvis flexible and um, procedures as needed to uh, control painful symptoms if they're present. I have another user asking, um, is there any age constraint for radiofrequency ablation for lumbar pain? I, I say no, and, to, and I'm not sure which direction they're thinking of. Certainly no on the older range of things. Um, in, in fact, uh, we use it more commonly in our more elderly patients because they are less ideal surgical candidates for uh, more long-term fixes that Dr. Braxton's able to provide, for example. Um, on the younger side of the spectrum, I really do try to avoid interventions for folks that are minors and in their young 20s outside of biologic procedures that I feel like have a very high likelihood of success. Um, and this goes back to some of the other questions about the side effects of ablations. I uh, really want to try every other option first and younger folks uh, often haven't had enough time living in their body to really exhaust other options prior to considering the treatment uh, like a radio frequency ablation. I'm a 57 year old male that had a left knee medial meniscus tear 30% that I had surgically removed. I had a synvisc injection on February 11th at VSO. I'm feeling mild improvement, but how long should I wait before I try PRP treatment? It seems the PRP treatment would be more beneficial for me than the hyaluronic acid. And they yeah, added, oh, sorry, they added um, forgot to mention, I have had left knee pain ever since I had my knee surgery two and a half years ago. Sure, sure. And so, um, you know, it's unfortunate. I apologize that you're still, you know, obviously having pain in the knee and certainly willing to help. Uh, there really is no uh, time constraint when it comes to visco supplementation. 
uh, with Synvisc and PRP. Often I'll use them together. There is no deleterious effect uh, or interaction between the two. If it was a steroid injection, just in case there's any questions regarding that, I typically like to wait, wait at least four to six weeks after the steroid injection to allow that to wash out. Uh, I think a PRP injection may well be a reasonable next step. I'd love to sit down and, and chat with you and look through your imaging, examine you and see if that's a realistic option moving forward, but uh, very well maybe based on what you're describing. Uh, often after knee scopes, we develop some degree of progressive arthritis. And so that may also be a source of persistent pain. Uh, so please feel free to reach out and, and come on in. We can chat about uh, options in that case. Treated my tennis elbow with PRP and was recommended that three treat to have three treatments spaced out that three sorry that three treatments spaced out six to eight weeks eight weeks apart would provide the best results and don't expect one treatment to have a meaningful impact. I think that's the um, advice she was given and insurance won't pay for it unless it is part of a surgical procedure. Reasoning is there is no significant documentation of success. Can you clarify this and the success rate? Oh, sure. So the ten, you know, tennis elbow lateral apocondylitis is the most well-studied diagnosis for PRP. It's very well documented to be effective out to and past two years of treatment. So I think, you know, I, if it's something that you need some backup, you know, going back and forth with your insurance company, I'm happy to help with that. There are several, several studies that demonstrate that. It was actually the first uh, tendon that was studied uh, for the use of PRP. We used to draw your whole blood and inject your whole blood into the tendon. And then we realized the red cells are really just inflammatory, where it's the platelets that are providing positive benefit. In fact, I would say the typical insurance cover treatment with corticosteroid for tennis treatment has been pretty well documented to make at least 50% of patients worse over the long term. And so, um, you know, I think going back and forth with your insurance company is a reasonable next step um, with that because there's very, very uh, robust data to suggest that PRP is a far superior treatment to anything else for tennis elbow, uh, especially in the absence of high grade tendon tears. Um, in terms of the series of injections, that's a, that is another uh, interesting question. So there's limited data out there in terms of series. There's a few studies that show it's more beneficial, a few that show it's not necessarily more beneficial. Um, it's been shown in you know tennis elbow and patellar tendinopathy that potentially repeated injections can be more helpful, but so can a single injection, and that's been well documented as well. So my general approach is not to overtreat patients and flare them up more than is necessary. I like to do a single injection typically, or sometimes two spaced a couple of weeks apart, depending on the de degree of tendon degeneration, and then see how they do over four to six months post-procedurally. I, I don't like to do a series of three injections when just one will suffice, and often one will suffice for tennis elbow when it's properly injected with ultrasound directly into the site of defect. Uh, you know, that's another issue with a lot of these studies is, you know, ultrasound guidance wasn't necessarily used for a lot of these from a visual perspective, how that PRP spread through the tendon, which is very important in my opinion. Um, so I would just, you know, I, I would be happy to kind of go back and forth with your insurance company um, on that uh, to go to bat for you, because I, I would say they're just frankly incorrect. And in terms of PRP with surgery, I would say the converse is true. It's been pretty well documented that uh, PRP for the most part during surgery is not effective in improving outcomes. Um, certainly there's some uh, studies using stem cells that, that have shown positive benefit, but PRP just from, you know, from a general thought uh, process doesn't really make sense with surgery. There's tons of bleeding during surgery. There's plenty of platelets that circulate through the sites um, of, the, of the surgery. And so augmenting with PRP often is not effective and it's been been pretty well proven uh, across several studies, you know, with some some caveats in there. So, sorry, long-winded answer, but complicated question. The short one um, is rehab required after PRP. Not necessarily required. It's often encouraged, especially for tendon-related disorders. For joints, it's not uh, necessarily as um, as necessary, but for tendons. The thought of eccentrically uh, loading the tendon, so you can actually load the tendon through uh, uh, PT with certain exercises, and that can synergize with PRP to allow for reorganization of our collagen fibrils. It's been uh, really well documented in Achilles tendonitis, so I typically um, will include uh, PT uh, with particularly tendon-related injections and often with low back-related injections when necessary with joint injections, although I don't find it to be as uh, necessary to formally rehab from a, say, a knee PRP injection. 
I have a partial thickness tear, uh, less or less than 50% of the rotator cuff. I received PRP about seven weeks ago without any relief. Do you try another PRP treatment? At what point do you resort to surgery? Yeah, so I'd say, I think the question actually says greater than 50% tear, which is an important caveat there. So I'd say the lower, yep, so the lower um, the degree of tearing, the more likelihood PRP is going to be effective. In my general practice, I say, you know, less than a third torn is ideal for PRP. Greater than 50%, the majority of the tendon is torn. It depends on what the MRI really looks like. If there's, if it's a tear and the fibers are still close together, that's a possibility to improve. If it's torn and retracted, that's far less likely to improve with PRP. Um, so I'd be happy to review your imaging and see if another one makes sense. It may or may not, depending on what that tear really looks like. Uh, but the flip side of that is, is I would say you're only seven weeks post and often it can take eight weeks before any significant improvement is seen and it can slowly improve up to four to six months with uh, rotator cuff PRP injections. So I'd say for now, what I'd recommend is you wait another month or two and really see how you feel uh, without over-treating it unless it's very painful and you need to pursue some type of treatment to get it feeling better. In that case, I'd be happy to review your imaging and see what makes the most sense and that may or may not be an additional PRP injection. Typically for tears, I'll also use activated PRP where you essentially reverse the anticoagulant that you use to produce the PRP. And so that allows the platelets to immediately claw and act more like glue directly in the tear. And so I'm not sure if that was used for your previous PRP injection, but would be uh, one potential opportunity to improve uh, that injection. But if it is, you know, truly a high grade tear with retraction, that's not very likely to improve with PRP um, over the long term. And so uh, depends on kind of what the tear looks like, but happy to further look at that in clinic. I'm going to switch back over to the other chat box for a second. Um, if three prolotherapy procedures on the lower back herniated disc were not successful, what is the probability that PRP or stem cells will be more successful? And I said prolotherapy? Yeah. Trigger? Sure. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily do uh, prolotherapy for uh, degenerated disc, although there is some evidence to say it could be successful. I'm a little concerned about the infection risk of injecting sugar into a disc where um, infections are really catastrophic. Um, for herniated discs, I typically do not use biologics uh, for treatment of that. It's not necessarily a defect of the collagen. Well, it is a defect of the collagen fibers, I should uh, clarify, but really a herniated disc is a mass occupying lesion. So it takes up space in our spinal canal and often causes sciatica. Um, I think, you know, in terms of treatment of that, it depends on what symptoms we're having. If there is sciatic symptoms with lower extremity nerve pain, typically epidural steroid injections, which are very conventional um, treatment covered by all insurances is a reasonable step or surgical intervention with a microdiscectomy with Dr. Braxton would be also reasonable if there's leg symptoms. Uh, if it's more isolated low back pain, it really depends on what the disc looks like and what our pain uh, feels like. So that's something that I would just recommend coming into clinic so we can really review your imaging in detail to have realistic expectations and talk about some different treatment plans. But typically for large, especially large herniated discs, I do not do intradiscal biologics because they actually have the opportunity to make those herniations worse as you pressurize the disc. So you just have to be careful with those um, disc herniations particularly. All right, I think that's pretty much all of the questions that we have, um, unless I'm missing any, I'm just going back through both of them. Yeah. Does anybody else have any last questions? Sorry, Dr. Nurky, what was that? Yeah, I see a couple of me just shout out, shout out a couple of things. So uh, PRP is not covered by Medicare, but radiofrequency ablations are, and radiofrequency ablations are covered for the shoulder, for the knee, for the hip, for the low back and neck. Um, and so um, that may be the best treatment option if we're trying to keep it uh, under the um, covered benefits of Medicare. And then I see another one from a retired physical therapist that I'm interested in. Let me just read through it real quick. Start a prologue in 2001. Uh, sorry, maybe I'll just read it. I'm a 79-year-old retired physical therapist, uh, has done uh, prolotherapy in 2001 for a subluxed uh, clavicle at the sternum, so the sternoclavicular joint. Uh, got me back swimming in 2010, uh, several joints flared, uh, PRP was added, success has occurred in hip bursitis, SI joint, torn Achilles, and to the dismay of our uh, dearly retired Dr. James, a torn meniscus. 
Uh, pain on a couple of these injuries exceeded at eight out of 10. I now swim competitively with national times for my age group. That's amazing. Uh, my doctor likes to do five injections every four weeks with no yoga or stretching during treatment. I'm a believer. So I guess there's no question, but a good testimonial for PRP. So thank you for that comment. Uh, I'm glad you're doing uh, so well with or without uh, how Dr. James may or not uh, feel about that. So congratulations that you're back to doing what you like to do with PRP. Looks like we got a question about the typical cost of PRP. Yeah, yeah. So PRP depends on um, what you're treating and where. So a simple, so say just simple injection, single joint, single tendon um, in clinic costs $950. And that's all inclusive for the um, for the physician fee, for the injection, for the processing. Uh, there's no surprises there. Uh, if we go and do multiple joints, I tend to give folks a bit of a break on that. So if we do say your hip and your knee, I charge $950 for the first joint and $250 for the second joint since we're using all the same equipment and uh, it doesn't take a significant amount of additional time for my staff. Um, so I'll give you a significant break on any additional injections. And then if we go to the surgery center, it's, there's a bit more cost involved as there's anesthesia involved, uh, rental fee for the room and equipment, the nurses. Um, help us out during the case. And so there's um, different prices depending on what we do at the surgery center. Uh, typically for a single or two um, body areas, it's less than $5,000 um, to go to the surgery center and do PRP or bone marrow injections, depending on and what we're treating. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nurki, it does look like we got a few questions over email. Oh, okay. Okay, let me rattling a couple off. Yeah. Okay, we have, here's one. Hi, my name is Teresa. I'm 53. I've had three surgeries in my right knee. The first one was an ACL repair and the other two meniscus repairs. I have scoliosis and I just started to have some arthritis. One month ago, my knee got very swelled and it was hard to walk. The swelling is gone, but now I have a hard time going up and down stairs and I feel pain in my knee. I don't want to do the cortisone injection or the knee replacement. I would like to know if the gel injection is an option or what other treatments are out there. Yeah, absolutely. So John, so I imagine what we're going to see in your knee is uh, post-traumatic uh, osteoarthritis. Um, so you have a few traumas and surgeries to your knee. So you're uh, likely at some point, I'm not sure how old you are or exactly when those surgeries were, but typically we start to develop some degree of osteoarthritis um, after a history like that. So a gel injection actually is a very reasonable step to try and get symptoms under control for six months without using steroid. Biologics may also be an option depending on what your anatomy looks like and what your pain is. Uh, if your knee gets very swollen again, just simply aspirating the fluid out of your knee also can be helpful uh, quite a bit for pain, uh, especially if you combine it with a treatment like a gel shot. So I think that's very reasonable. And then if this is very refractory, you know, doesn't respond with aspirations, with uh, gel injections, with corticosteroid, not interested in biologics, then that's where our radiofrequency ablation procedure uh, has a lot of utility uh, short of a uh, surgical procedure like a joint replacement. Okay, we got a couple more in the Q&A box. Um, sorry, one second, let me just scroll down. I see one, I see a couple regarding cervical discs. Let me talk about cervical discs okay. in general. So I see one, uh, would PRP or stem cell injections into cervical discs help my crepitus? I only have mild pain, but severe crepitus. I would say um, in terms of discs, the discs tend not to provide, they tend not to produce much in the way of crepitus. Crepitus is kind of that crack and pop and mechanical type symptom in our neck. Often those are actually our facet joints that are contributing to that pain or soft tissue as the tendons and ligaments glide over each other. Um, certainly you can do PRP or stem cells for cervical discs, but it seems like if it's really crepitation that we're um, trying to treat, then treating our facet joints may be uh, more reasonable. And that's where an in-person consultation where we look at imaging and examine you uh, would be helpful. Crepitation is more of a mechanical symptom that has to do with bone spurs kind of rubbing against each other. Um, it's not necessarily um, the main target of treatment with these type of procedures. It's really pain that we're trying to improve, although crepitation can certainly improve with facet joint uh, interventions, although it's less likely to than pain as it's uh, generally the interaction of our bone spurs that's producing uh, those type of um, symptoms. But happy to take a look at stuff if you wanna come in and chat with me and look through imaging together. And it looks like that individual did ask a similar question at the beginning. So I think he just reworded it. Not sure if you see the first one from Jeff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that covers it pretty much. Awesome. So PRP, can PRP done in the same day as exam and diagnosis? Absolutely can. 
uh, PRP, the visit time for the PRP takes a little bit longer. So it just depends on kind of how busy my day is mostly, but um, I just had a, a new uh, PA start with my team who's doing great, has been helping me um, just kind of with efficiency in my uh, clinical day. So much more of a possibility now than it has been uh, in the past. Um, so happy to, um, you know, uh, try my best to get that done the same day if that's meaningful to you. If it is something you like to do, just a simple kind of call ahead of time can really help us facilitate getting that done if you do, if you are traveling from a ways or have a specific day that uh, you'd like to do that on. So as much advance notice as you can uh, give us the, the more opportunity we have to do that, but certainly it's an opportunity to do it on the same day if there uh, is a reason to. Okay. Can PRP or stem cells help with pain from arthritis of the main joint of the thumb? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So the CMC joint, I think is what you're referring to the carpal metacarpal joint. It's one of the most common joints in the whole body to get osteoarthritis. Again, depends on the severity of osteoarthritis. I find myself often treating those CMC joints when we go in and do bone marrow harvest for other joints. So say we're treating a hip and a knee and a patient has a painful thumb. It's a very small joint. So I typically just put a little uh, stem cell in there as well if we are going to go in and treat other big joints and that's a painful area, but absolutely can be helpful as can steroid injections. Um, and there are a few surgical procedures that Dr. Dork and Dr. Joseph uh, have at their ready to um, help with that more long-term as well if necessary. All right. I think that's all the questions unless you see any additional ones, Dr. Nurki. No, I think that's uh, it. And Susan, you're welcome. Thank you okay. for coming out. All right, thanks everybody. Um, if you do have any last minute questions, feel free to shoot, shoot them over real quick. Um, this will be posted on our YouTube channel and on our website. Uh, so please head to our website, vsortho.com um, and keep a lookout on your email because we'll be sending this to you as well. Thanks for attending and please keep an eye out for more of these events. We'd love to have you. Great. Thanks, Rachel. And thanks everyone for coming out tonight. I really appreciate uh, all the folks that spent their evening with us. Uh, it really means a lot to me that you're interested in this. So happy to help with anyone, uh, be it with biologics or anything else. It's just uh, one piece of my practice. And so happy to uh, uh, see what we can do to help for any of these painful conditions. So thank you very much. Have a good night. Have a great night, everyone.